I think by then I may have had an agent or, or knew of an agent that had clued me in that, you know, MGM was looking for someone to come on to fame. And um, they wanted somebody that had a little different sound. I knew that. They wanted the hip new sound, whatever that was. So I think that I sat with my friend who had a, an instrument called a Fairlight, which was a pretty massive, cool synthesizer of the time that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now they, now they cost $300, but anyway. Um, I think we created a few pieces of music that were really kind of different. And weirdly, then the producer listened to a bunch of cassette tapes, and he picked mine. And I got invited to go over and do Fame. And so I was the Fame composer, and that's when I had to actually bail out from Mike. I had to called Mike up, and I said, um, God, Mike, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but I so appreciate everything you're doing for me, and but I've got a chance to do a, a show. And he, he was so great. He goes, are you kidding? Dude, go do it. He goes, you're done. You're done with me. You got your own show. Go do it and kill him. Knock him dead. And so that was great. And so I went and did Fame and did, wow, a good solid two to three years of that show. And what was so great for me on that show, John, was that every week Fame had a different, you know, uh, theme, meaning we could be doing uh, high opera one week and then we could be doing kind of not hip hop wasn't even around. We could be doing some kind of urban thing or we could be doing jazz. And it was a great, again, in hindsight, I was so lucky. Like, how do you, how do you fall into a TV show that does all these different things and you get to kind of fail miserably and then pick it up next week and go and try something different. Fame was, was, artistic, arts driven. Yeah. It was all about music and dance yes. and, and kids learning on the way up. Yep. Were you involved with pre-recording? Were you writing music that would then be performed on camera as well as dramatic underscore? No. And here's why. Okay. That was a whole other big job to do. And I think if memory serves me right, there's a gentleman named Gary Stockdale or somebody like that who was very adept at doing these pre-records. So whoever that gentleman was, they would do the pre-records and work with Debbie Allen. It was really involved because it was doing the pre-records and then doing the dance numbers and rehearsing. So every now and then, I would either do one of those pieces or I would arrange some of it or I would just do the underscore. So luckily I didn't have to do both jobs because it was pretty it was intense. You know, it's all music all the time. Was your underscore mostly synthesizers? No. So it was live musicians too? Strangely, it started more synthetic with this instrument I told you about. And then we'd bring in a few players. We'd bring in, uh, or a small group. I'd do a string quartet or I'd do a little 10-piece band because whatever the needs of the show were. If, if we were, if they were doing a, a school play and it involved something that I had to, represent musically, I would do that. As the show went on, they sort of the ambition of the show got larger, and so they wanted kind of a bigger sound. So I would start to work with, over time, you know, 22-piece orchestra or 30, something like that. But it would vary week to week. We might do two or three in that synthetic mode, then we might be two, do two or three in the more overblown.